Did you know that in the first 300 years of the life of the church, it was illegal to be a Christian? Yes, until the year 313, in the Roman Empire, it was a crime to belong to Christianity, which was considered a cult. But in the year 313, the son of St. Helena, named Constantine, the emperor, finally freed Christians from their status and they became one of the religions of the empire. They had been, prior to that, living, praying, worshiping, and burying underground. You probably heard of the labyrinthine tunnels underneath the city of Rome when the Christians would gather to celebrate, to pray, they would go down into these catacombs and then leave their loved ones buried within. Now when they came out of these catacombs in 313, it was the first time they could worship publicly and invite others to join them. And then about 60 years later in the year 380, the Emperor Theodosius declared Christianity to be the official religion of the Roman Empire. But declaring something official and its actual conversion of hearts is quite another thing. In fact, even by the year 400, they still had the gladiators fighting, fighting to their death with giant crowds of so-called converted Christians. So one of the saintly monks by the name of Father Almachius went down one day as the gladiators were gathering at the base of the Colosseum and he put, his, put up his arms to stop them. And the crowd in the Colosseum began heckling this saintly priest and eventually they stoned him to death. Saint Almachius' death, however, was not in vain because when the emperor heard of this, not long thereafter, he forbade the gladiators fighting to their death. Blindness among these new Christians, blindness to the teaching of the gospel, deafness to the truth that sets us free. How many of us have heard the gospel for decades in our lives? And for some, it may be new. Some of you in the RCIA hearing it for the first time. And the question is, Will we have the conversion of heart that this blind man had when he encountered Jesus? You remember, at first he calls him sir. And then he's questioned by the authorities. And after he tells them what happened when he receives his sight, that process of receiving his sight, what does he say when they ask who this man must be? He says, a prophet. And then finally, when he meets Jesus again, now actually seeing him, with his own eyes for the first time. Jesus says, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? Well, he's the man standing right before you. And he says, I do believe, Lord. Do you hear he went from sir, to prophet, to Lord, and then he worshiped him. He was truly set free, not only from physical blindness, but spiritual blindness. Do we have that spiritual blindness today? So many times we get into the blame game. Notice that's what they're wanting, his apostles wanting to know. Why is this man blind? Who sinned since it was from birth? Is it his mother's sin? Is it his father's sin? Is it? No, it is not a generational sin. It has nothing to do with that. But often we do blame people for whatever difficulty they're facing. We blame ourselves. You remember when Jesus was taken by the evil one during those 40 days, Jesus is lent, if you will, in the desert. The evil one tempted him, tempted, dared to tempt Jesus with profit, pleasure, prestige, the power over all the world he could have had. And Jesus rejected it all because it's not God's vision for us. God's vision 
is completely different. Notice what happened when the Lord chose David, who was the smallest of the brothers of that family. David who would succeed Saul. The Lord tells Samuel not to look at the appearance because God looks into the heart. And that's what the Lord sees, what is in our hearts. Maybe we're blind to our own hearts. Maybe we're living in darkness. We think we see just fine. But in fact, there's darkness in the soul. And Jesus wants to deliver us from that darkness and lead us into the light. Yesterday, our parish celebrated its patronal feast, the Feast of the Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, March 25th. And at that Annunciation, Mary, who had been trained in the Word of God, she knew the Hebrew Scriptures, she had been taught that Word, that light of God. Even still, with her understanding of Scripture, when the angel gave her that news of what was to happen, she was frightened, she was confused, she didn't quite understand it, couldn't imagine the implications. But what did Mary do? In the end, she stepped forward in faith and said, let it be. The Latin word for it is fiat. Not the car, but the phrase fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum. Let it be done to me according to your word. Mary, at that moment then, conceives the Savior of the world. The new Adam is now in the womb of the new Eve. Mary's yes changes history. And God is asking a yes from us. A yes to the light of his holy word. And that may sound easier than it really is. Because if we say yes, it calls for a change of life. It calls for looking inside to say, what's going on inside my soul that isn't in accord with the divine will? What is it that I need to be delivered from so that I can actually reflect the light of Jesus Christ as did the blind man who received his sight? Some years ago, a musician that I think most of you know lost his mother. She died in 1956. She was a, an Irish woman living in Liverpool, England by the name of Mary McCartney. She'd been a nurse in the hospital for many years, came down with cancer and died. Fourteen years later, her son, Paul, composed a song that many believed was about his mother. But if you actually listen to the words, they may well have been inspired about the Blessed Virgin. It's called, Let It Be. When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And in my hour of darkness, she's standing right in front of me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And when the broken-hearted people living in the world agree, there will be an answer, let it be. For though they may be parted there is still a chance that they will see. There will be an answer. Let it be. And when the night is cloudy, there is still a light that shines on me. Shine on until tomorrow. Let it be. I wake up to the sound of music. Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom. Let it be. Those are Mary's words. Let it be. Yes, Lord. I may not understand it completely. I don't exactly know what you have in store for me, but I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to say yes. Every time you say amen, do you know what it means? So be it. Let it be. You're in accord with God's will. That's what you're proclaiming. Now the question is, are we living it? Are we shedding light for the world, Christ's light, in the midst of the darkness? St. Amachia stood as a light in the Colosseum where darkness prevailed, but not for long, because the light of Christ shined upon them. And so as we make our way through the fourth week of Lent, 
Let us remember that Christ will give you light, St. Paul said to the Ephesians, and Mary's yes opened the world to the light of the world, Jesus Christ. Let it be. Amen.